Welcome to Pivot and Thrive. I'm Karen McCarthy, founder of the Vermont Collaborative Circle and host of the Pivot and Thrive Community, a resource hub for entrepreneurs dedicated to supporting small businesses and families to grow and thrive. Today, we're here to be inspired and learn from entrepreneurs who have experience in crowdfunding. We're recording today on Abenaki land. We'll have the opportunity for a brief Q&A at the end, so feel free to populate your questions throughout the call into the chat, and we'll discuss them before we close today. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to um, facilitate this panel discussion by having an introduction of each of the business owners, hear their stories, and then we'll have the Q&A involving all their voices um, at the end. So. Thank you so much for joining us. Today, we're going to start with Kayla Silver. Kayla is the owner and founder of Salt and Bubbles Wine Bar and Market, coming soon to Essex Junction this summer. She's a certified sommelier, a hospitality industry veteran, consultant manager, and has spent the last four years at the award-winning Honey Road Restaurant in Burlington, Vermont. Thank you so much, Kayla. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, should I just jump right in? Great. Um, well, thank you all for, for coming. Um, the crowdfunding, or as I, I had wound up titling it, community sourcing that I did for my business, um, it was always something I had planned on doing, but um, funding is hard. I just want to start by saying funding is just really hard, and it doesn't matter where you're getting it from, whether it's traditional financing, uh, you're financing it yourself, you're financing it through yourself and a partner, or you're crowdsourcing. It's all really hard to either rely on just yourself or to ask for help. And asking for help is basically community or crowdsourcing. So I want to just start by saying even considering it is a step in the right direction of the lesson that I've already learned within entrepreneurship, which is you have to ask for help. This is not a solo game ever. Um, so one of the major reasons that I looked into community sourcing was because I'd seen it be really successful, particularly in the hospitality sector. Traditional financing is not a friend of hospitality um, for a variety of reasons, besides the statistics that, you know, basically say most, most hospitality businesses fail within however many years. Um, and I hate to use the word fail. It's more like they hit a bunch of roadblocks they maybe weren't prepared for and it, it just brought them to a closure. Um, so on paper, particularly my kind of hospitality business, and these are all just kind of, you know, terms that if anybody's in any questions, just let me know. Um, I am a um, cash heavy, low inventory, um, and therefore low equity positioning business. Um, and not only that, being in the hospitality sector in addition to all of those things on paper makes me an unattractive option for most traditional financing. On top of that, women are statistically underfunded by traditional banking institutions. So that doesn't help matters. Um, so in searching for funding, um, I also wanted to do something that wasn't going to release any equity of my company and crowdsourcing also accomplishes that goal. It was also in some ways a proof of concept for traditional funding to then look at what I've done and say, okay, you have people who are willing to put money into a business that doesn't even exist yet, basically because they know you or because you're presenting an option for them that they're excited about in their neighborhood or just in general, um, which I have a particular advantage around because I don't really have any competition for my particular sector of business out in my area, um, which made the community around here really excited. Um, Okay, and then the other thing is I knew I was going to have to go through traditional bank financing because I was less interested in venture capital or private investors who would ask for a really big chunk of my company. Um, and going via the Small Business Administration, you need to have a percentage of the loan that you are um, that you have cash on hand already. And I invested a certain a, a, enough money to meet that threshold. Um, but again, being an unattractive option to them, I, I knew I would need more than just that minimum. And this helped me get there. Even if I never touched these crowdsourcing dollars, having them in the bank was important. Um, okay. So that's kind of how and why I decided to do crowdsourcing. Um, the process 
it was a lot of research. It was a lot of talking to people. And I had the pleasure of already having two of the most successful crowdsourcing campaign people. I already knew as my now previous, but at the time current bosses, which are Kara and Allison from Honey Road Restaurant, they didn't really publicize it all that much because frankly, they actually had enough people in their corner that they were able to just launch it on their own website as a house account or pre-sale. Um, and they never even titled it as crowdsourcing or community sourcing. Um, I liked that model, but I knew I'd have to put a little bit more of an approachable spin on it. Um, but they raised almost $25,000 from that crowdsourcing effort back then. And they had only posted on their Instagram account with a not even great photo once. Um, but that, that was really more of a testament to like who these ladies were in rooted in their communities than it was their actual marketing efforts. Um, so I took a note out of their book and then I did a lot of research to look at other campaigns on Indiegogo, GoFundMe, all these other places and just kind of see who's doing what and what's working, maybe what isn't. Um, and then, uh, I'm sorry, just kind of looking through my notes here. Um, the other piece of it was that a lot of these campaign crowdsourcing platforms, um, the reason that I wound up choosing to do it on my own webpage was because, again, for the SBA, I needed to have the dollars on hand in an account ready to show, like to show them, not just tell them, here's the live website. You can see I raised these dollars. Unfortunately for them, that's not enough. Um, and using sites like um, Indiegogo or GoFundMe, I, I'm not sure about um, We Fund Women actually, but they all hold your money for quite a bit of time. Um, particularly Indiegogo can hold those funds for up to three weeks. And for me, three weeks was the duration of a campaign and I needed to really move quickly. Um, the other piece was that originally I actually hadn't intended to run this campaign before I would I received SBA funding. Originally, I had planned on doing it the months leading up to opening as a ramp up to get people excited. Um, and essentially, I could go into a much longer story about my first attempts at getting SBA financing being denied and then coming back with a revised version, but I, I'll skip all through that to let to just come full circle to um, basically just saying that I, I was in a crunch. I needed to be able to show proof of concept. I needed to raise these funds in order to receive the SBA financing, which brings me to my next point of a lot of people ask, well, what happens if you don't open? And what was easy actually to say was, well, this money is helping me get to the next stage. And I'm never, this money is meant to be my contingency fund. I'm actually not intending on touching any of these dollars unless I'm 99% of the way to opening and I need to buy that one last piece of equipment or that extra bit of inventory. And there's no question about whether or not we will open. So the answer to all of those people's questions were, you will get your money back if we don't open. And I do think that that's really something you have to be extremely clear about and you have to be really ready to answer that question. Um, and if you're not ready to answer it with, you'll get your money back, you, you should come up with a system for how maybe you'll repay them in product or in other services. Um, so just kind of getting to things like taxes. I wound up just chatting with my accountant, um, whether you have one or you don't have one through this collaborative circle, I think there's actually a few who might even be willing to help us out here. Um, and basically what they had said was it gets counted as income tax. Unfortunately, that does take a big chunk out of it. Um, as we all know, as self-employed people, there's a not a huge incentive necessarily from a tax perspective to be self-employed, but it ends up basically being counted as business income. Um, you should categorize it as crowdsourcing anyway, if you're using QuickBooks or other methods, just so that it shows a differentiation of like, it wasn't for products sold. Um, it can even be counted as investment money, but the business still accounts for it and pays taxes on it. Um, that doesn't mean that there are taxes that need to be transferred to the customer though, during their checkout process. Um, the other thing was, uh, and this is something that I actually noticed on a number of um, campaigns that I saw that maybe this person or those business owners hadn't reached out to legal counsel. When you're creating your um, incentives, um, 
they can't be lifelong. They actually have to have a specific value and endpoint. So basically when you do things like, for instance, if I were a coffee shop and I said, you get one free coffee a week for the rest of your life. That's actually considered, even if it's under a percentage, it's actually considered equity. And technically that person, if they really weren't such a great person, they could actually sue you and, and they could actually make you liable for issuing them statements of equity. Um, and so you, when you're thinking of these incentives, you know, instead of saying you get 10% off for life, it could be you just get 10% off for the first year of being open. It could be that you just, you know, get a free coffee for the first three years of being open. That's still, there's a definitive end point and there's a definitive sort of value set. Um, and the last thing that I want to say just about the process was, um, and I really encourage people to reach out to her because she has just a wealth of knowledge in this realm, uh, Louisa Shibley who is a uh, founding member of Milk Money Vermont. If you're not familiar with Milk Money Vermont, um, I highly encourage you to consider being familiar with Milk Money. They originally only did an equity positioning crowdsourcing where Vermonters could essentially put in any value of money from $500 to $20,000 for whatever equity positioning it would have made them appropriately receiving. Um, for a variety of businesses. And there were a number of businesses that very successfully worked through this campaign, but it essentially makes the company almost public, publicly owned. Um, they realized that that was not as attractive an option for everyone. And they're now getting into what are called, pre, what they're titling pre-sales, which is way more similar to the one option that I have on my um, crowdsour community sourcing site, which was um, uh, basically the house account. Essentially, it's uh, take CIFA, for instance, um, if I had a house account with Wilder Wines for $500, um, basically, she could set the parameters for if I have a house account for $500, I'm allowed to draw down from that house account either by a dollar value or a percentage every month. Um, and I can explain more in Q&A if people have more questions about that later. But it, it's a great model, and it's something that definitely folks should consider. The last big piece of consideration, and this is again for Q&A later for more detail, um, is make sure you're looking out for your bottom line. Do not give too much away when you're creating these incentives. It's really hard to price things at such an inflated value when you know that's not their real price, but you're not fundraising if you're not actually doing that. You're just kind of selling goods. Um, you're just doing business as usual. Um, and that's, that's, again, just sort of moving into what I learned. That's really hard for me because my whole brand is around being affordable and approachable. And the idea of selling essentially my like swag bag for almost three times its actual value was really hard for me to actually want to do. But that's sort of the nature of the crowdfunding world. You're not doing yourself any favors if you're, you know, pricing something at only a 10% or 15% markup over what it actually would have been. You're actually just hurting your bottom line. You're basically giving people a sale um, and you're not actually raising what you think you're raising. Um, and and uh, the other things I learned are just that, again, asking for help is hard. It, the whole process feels weird. You're advertising yourself, you're asking for help the whole time. And especially as women, and, and, you know, it's not always about being a woman, but it is really, really hard to not only be a woman in business, but to then put yourself in an even more vulnerable position by asking for this kind of help. But what's even better about it, and this is really the takeaway, is how amazing your community really is and how much they will show up for you. Um, we wound up raising just a little bit over $20,000. And so many of those people, I've never met them. I've never met them a day in my life. And it was way more impressive for the banks as well to see 200 plus people contribute at 20, 30, $40 than it would have been to have 25 people who each contributed $1,000. That's not impressive. That's just, you have a wealthy base of people. Um, and um, the other thing I would say is just on social media, it's incredibly important that when you do see campaigns like this that you wanna support, to like them, to share them, and to save them. Instagram is not helping us right now. Um, their algorithms, especially with the launch of Reels, we are 
we are all of your posts you're just getting like funneled to the bottom so whenever you're trying to support another business please 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 always remember to like to comment to save and to share if you really feel that it's appropriate um and just if i were to do it again i probably would have uh <laughs> um Oh boy, I probably would have just thought about the details a little bit more of everything before I just launched it. Because <laughs> uh, I had a couple of people being like, hey, I'm trying to select shipping. It's not letting me do that. <laughs> I was just like, okay, I'm gonna fix it, I promise. So I probably just would have run through it once or twice more. But that that was really it. Uh, that's everything. I hope I didn't go over my time. Kayla, thank, thank you so much. That was just fantastic. And the insights that you shared from the business perspective, I think are so valuable for people starting out to have the confidence um, to, you know, go about it with questions, to seek community, to draw upon the insights and experience of people who have done it before them as you did, you know, drawing upon the connections that you had in the community, I think is, is really insightful to share. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm sure we will have questions to dive into in the Q and A. Okay. Next up, we have Sifa Lam, who is a new business owner. Her business is Wilder Wines, a wine shop that is located on Cherry Street that focuses on natural wines or minimal intervention wines. She's been on the, in the food and beverage industry for the past 12 years and is super excited to be a part of this community of women-owned businesses. Hi, I'm Sifa. Um, and a little bit about my funding story. So I actually... What Kayla said is like totally on point. I thought that I could do this on my own and I didn't even think about like, I knew I didn't wanna take out any loans from the bank. Um, I got some money through like my family and then my own money as well. And it, it was like my IRA, you know, I took advantage of the fact that you could pull from your IRA right now and not be penalized because of COVID. So I did that, but then I realized with everything adding up, all of my expenses, all of my inventory, the space, the fees, it was a lot of money. And it was a lot of money that I, that I just like would either have to take out a loan and I needed a cushion. So Kayla was actually the one that inspired me to just last minute do, do a community sourcing, which is amazing. You know, it's, it's so nice to, I found that we were both kind of doing the same thing at the same time. And so I actually asked her a lot of questions, but I, I spent one night having drinks with some girlfriends and I was talking to them about finances and how I was like, I don't know what to do. Like, I think I need to move home and live at my mom's house because I, I would rather do that and put all of my money into my business than live, pay a thousand dollars a month for an apartment. And so my friends were like, I don't know why you wouldn't. You've been a part of this community for the past 10 years. Um, I grew up here. I'm from here. My first job was at Penny Clouse when I was 18 years old. I'm 31 now. So, you know, and I, I've built those connections within the community. And then I was the opening manager at Honey Road. And I lived in Boston for four years. So my friends were like, you know, you've built these connections, why wouldn't you use them? And then why wouldn't you draw more awareness to what you are trying to do? And then when I found out Kayla was doing her crowd, her crowdfunding, I was like, she's doing crowdfunding. This is amazing. That means that like, there will be people that want to support you and want to invest in you. Um, and so I started, I used iFundWomen and I really loved the platform but it actually like didn't work half of the time. A lot of my, a lot of my um, funders were having a hard time accessing it. And so I ended up also using Venmo. I just like connected my, my business account to my Venmo and did it that way. But um, you know, another reason why I'm really happy I did the crowdfunding was because it drew so much more people to, to everything that I'm doing and what I'm bringing to the community, even though you, when I came up with my business plan, I was like, okay, this is what I'm bringing. This is the need, this is everything. But you aren't as connected with your community when you're just making a business plan and you don't feel the love and the support until you ask for help, you know? And so that was one thing too, is I was terrified of asking for help. And I was like, oh my God, what if like nobody 
wants this and you feel like very alone. But when I started my campaign, it was just, there was so much support, whether people were just sharing or donating $5, $10, $100, like it all adds up, you know, like it all really adds up. And then it makes them feel so much more invested in the community and invested in another small business and invested in you and like who you are and what you're bringing to the community. Um, so, so that was great. Um, so my word of advice is I probably wouldn't use I fund women because it didn't really work that well for me. I did actually, however, I spoke to Kayla about this, but I did actually get a lot of emails from investors through I fund women that stumbled upon um, my profile. And they were like, Hey, we want to, I want to invest. Like, tell me about your story. And I wasn't sure if it was like a scam, like, Oh, they're going to, it was like a, a prince, you know, I'll send you a check and you send me the rest back or something. But um, they ended up being like real investors and they did want to invest, but I was in the same boat with Kayla. I didn't want to give away any part of my company because I also just wasn't sure like how much I could afford to give away, if any, because your first year, ultimately you're not making any money. So I, I just couldn't make these promises to people um, and especially just give them anything in return. So I did do a very, like, I, I would call it like a very ballsy crowdfunding. I had very little incentive for people because I wanted them to do it out of like the kindness of their heart instead of giving them really anything in return. So I did do like tote bags, um, but that was like, you know, you had to donate a hundred dollars minimum to get a tote bag. Um, and so I think for me, I just, I also didn't know like how much I could give. It was a lot of my own personal money and a lot of it was already tied up in, in the space and inventory. And so I wanted people to just be generous and give what they could, whether it was $5 or $10 or $100 and not necessarily get anything back. Does that sound like just kind of weird? I just wanted them to be a part of my journey, you know? Um, and then, um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, a lot of my insight, to be honest, I got from Kayla whenever I felt really stuck with anything. I was like, Kayla, like, how did you do this? This doesn't make any sense. Help me. So it was really nice. I actually was able to connect with a lot more people and a lot more like, you know, Kayla and other other women who were her who were looking for different sources of of um, of funding. Um, and we did talk a lot about you know, like, what do you want to give away? And I was like, at one point I was like, Kayla, like this person wants this. And she was like, well, you'd have to get a lawyer. So yeah. So that's my, that's my story. Thank you. That's fantastic. I mean, you know, I'm a huge fan of community and collaboration. Yeah. So to hear that you are creating that connection and drawing upon each other's strengths to leverage your own is yeah. it's just such a powerful testament. I really appreciate that. Um, and next up we have Fareen Paris Meyer, owner of All Heart Inspirations. She creates heart-centered spaces through storytelling workshops, community engagements, culinary cuisine, and more. She aspires to make a collective difference with our local Vermont community and beyond one story at a time. We all have stories worth telling, so what's yours? Thank you, Fareen. Hello, hello, hello. Um, thank you for having me here and Kayla and Sifa. Thank you for your narratives. Like I'm muted, but I was like, yes. And so just the, the wisdom and um, just again, the beauty of what it means when empowered humans in our community can help empower other individuals. Um, so I am the owner of All Heart Inspirations and my narrative um, with community sourcing, I love that reframe on that word as well. Like there's just like an energy to that. Um, it's not necessarily about um, my business. I launched it last July in 2020. And um, it community sourcing has come into play, not necessarily to help sustain my overall offerings or workshops or classes that I'm doing. It's when I have these like big 
community ideas of just my desire to love on a particular group or community need that's existing and wanting to rally up the village um, to help make it happen. And, um, and that is just part of my upbringing. I'm growing up, um, I'm a daughter of immigrants in the Haitian community. This is what we did. It was like, wait a minute, we got to like help pay this tuition bill. Like let's rally up the aunties and the uncles. I remember my first trip to Italy. I wanted to go to Italy my senior year of high school. And it was, it was community sourcing I was doing. Like friends were throwing change into my jar at lunch. People were sending checks to my parents. And it was the village that gifted me with the opportunity to see Italy at 17. And, um, and so that's just such a part of my core and the way that I do this work. Um, and uh, I am going to share the narrative of the, re the project that I'm working on right now um, that I'm community sourcing for, and that's to help celebrate um, Juneteenth, um, which is a holiday that comes up in the month of June on June 19th, honoring when we truly did have uh, freedom from, from slavery and all of that narrative. And it's really been something that's near and dear in the, you know, in the Black community, the BIPOC community, and, you know, with time, um, more and more people are taking the energy to honor and recognize that day because it's part of our collective history living in this country. Um, and so the city of Burlington is making it an official like day to recognize. There's a committee going, events. It's going to be great. But before I even knew there was a committee happening, Freen Paris Meyer on her own <laughs> ship was like, hey, what can I do to love on Black identified Vermonters? It has been quite the year. Um, in light of what just happened this week. And for me, I see people trying to figure out how can I support um, some of this narrative with our BIPOC community, our Black community. And so I um, had a beautiful working relationship that started budding with Whistling Man Schooner, another woman entrepreneur, Captain Diddy, Hannah. And we've been combining storytelling and sailing. And so I had reached out and I was like, Hannah, what would it look like for Juneteenth 2021 this year to have sailing storytelling um, boats for our black community where they do not pay they just all they have to do is show up and it's us tending to their um their their heart deposit their spirit deposit my vision is um we have boats each boat has a, a black identified storyteller either someone like myself or someone who's taking one of my classes we have refreshments on the boat and all they have to do is show up this is just one way for us to pour into them um, because for me i found sailing when i started doing it last summer very healing for me and my narrative and she was like let's fix like of course and and i was like all right but this is not just on us this is a village situation um i have three called i have two call to actions you're either registering to be on this boat and have some fun because you are a black vermonter or you're donating because this is you depositing into a community and i think the less something i just want to say is is that sometimes investing in something or collecting funds is not a deposit into you and, and, and that is part of what it means to be a community member. You know, it's like there are people who are sponsoring this event, uh, giving me money, giving me refreshments. They will not be on these boats. They will not even maybe even get insight to what the conversations were, uh, what were the narratives shared because it's affinity space, right? So in affinity space, we really try to honor what happens in the affinity space stays in the affinity space. And so for me, it's, it's quite something to see people come show up and want to pour into this project um, because it's an act of selflessness in particular if you don't identify as a black Vermonter. But for me growing up and seeing how that was role modeled for me, sometimes you're the receiver and sometimes you're the giver. We go back and forth playing these roles. And so I am a dreamer and I have a lot of big ideas, but then it's like a matter of how do I get people to see it and feel it and 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 know that like and, and see my dream and the energy that's in my head. And so things I had to start wrapping my head around was like, you know, I, you know, I'm like, Zero, you want to do this with me? And they're like, you know, and they're like, of course, because I have an established relationship with zero gravity. But there are other folks who don't know me from anyone. Like I'm only 10 months old. Um, and so I don't have these established roots in the community. 
And in particular with the identities that I hold as you were naming Kayla, being a woman, but being a black woman and trying to get Vermont on board with something that is centered in blackness, when there can be such a uh, resistance to that because of the anti-blackness culture and the white supremacy culture that exists in the state, this is quite the feat that I'm trying to do, but I do believe and I want to believe that as a collective community, people can see what this will do um, to, to help black Vermonters that just need some love and like not have to fight about life right now because it can feel like that. And so I had to use my craft. You're a storyteller, Freen. How are you gonna tell your story to these sponsors? And so um, people wanna know what's the website? And I'm like, I don't have that yet because it's not live. And so having to put other practices in place. And so I made that presentation to get that political status, right? Like it introduces who I am, here are my goals, here are the benefits of sailing and storytelling and what it comes to depositing into the BIPOC community. Here is the money that I'm trying to raise. Here is how I will use it. And here is all the ripples that will come if we hit this $14,000 goal. We will give 50 Vermonters free sailing. We will be supporting local businesses because I'll be using that money to get refreshments, right? Like, let me go pick up some wine from Wilder or whatever it may be, right? Um, we will be compensating up to seven black storytelling artists from the community. Um, we will um, be connecting people during a pandemic time when connection was canceled. Um, I will be hiring black identified folks to help do my photography, do my videography. So it ripples, the money is feeding us in a variety of different ways. And then lastly, any extra money that's left, I identified somebody who I wanted it to go to. And so proceeds, of what's left after all the bills are paid um, are go is going to Candace Taylor, owner of Conscious Homestead. Um, and sh because she is someone who does long-term healing for the BIPOC community, right? Like there's quick fixes you can do. And then there's folks who are doing the work every day. And that's Candace. And she is in the process of building a BIPOC homeless center on her, in her backyard, which will offer all of these resources for BIPOC people. And it will cost us nothing. So for me, any extra money I get, that's going to go to Candace because she's doing some of the long term deep work when some of us are going to need to tag out and get back to our jobs. So that was important to me. I'm like, I'm going to raise the money and I'm going to spend it all. It's either going to go to the event or it's going to Candace. And so that's how I'm using this crowdsourcing um, mentality around a passion project, um, because sometimes you know, you want to do this, but this would take such a hit to an emerging business like myself to take on the financial responsibility of doing this. And, you know, maybe with time, long term, I won't have to crowdsource in this way if we can make this be a traditional weekend. Um, but for now, I believe in it takes a village. And I see that like Vermont is so beautiful in that way that once you know people and they know your story, they're gonna start, you know, rooting for you. Like I literally went to Wilder Wines because my feed would not stop blowing up about this opening. And I'm like, who's this goddess and what is going on? And then like, you know, you know, the bartender at Hotel Vermont is like, oh my gosh, like she's me. And I'm like, okay. And so I, it is, this is what it is about. It's about the village. It's about taking time to pour into people and then being open to receiving the gesture as well. Um, so I'm in the process of the registration will go live on May 1st. Um, so then people will have the website that they need, I think sometimes to make it feel all valid and all of that stuff and I get that. And so I, I try to find the balance because me being a BIPOC entrepreneur, there are ways of I wanting to do the work that doesn't necessarily align with the professionalism words that, you know, that exist here in Vermont. And it's a constant tension because I'm like, homie, you know me, you know my heart. Like I'm a good person just trying to do good for work that isn't happening in this community. It's not even my job to tend to black people this way, but people aren't doing it. So I'm trying to step up and do it, but I just need help because I can't hold the emotional labor and the financial labor on my back as a black woman. It's way too much. Um, but People like to see the website. They like to see the official Venmo. They like to see who is already vouching for you. And so I'm using my connections and, and already putting it out there. Like Peace and Justice Center is on board. Zero Gravity is on board. Red Wagon is on board. Um, uh, you know, Burlington City Arts is on board because those are people who have status in the community. I hate that I have to do that because I would love to for my story to stand on its own. 
but this is kind of how some of this works. And I'm learning that as I do this dance um, as an entrepreneur. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there so that we can um, get into kind of Q&A um, sure. for us to kind of talk more about all this beautiful wisdom um, that both Kayla, Sifa and I have like dropped into the space. Farine, thank you so much for sharing the work that you're doing. I mean, that's an incredible body of work to take on in addition to running your own business. And I think it's inspiring to me because we started the conversation about how it can be difficult to ask for help, thinking about our own businesses, but then thinking about the community and how we can ask each other to show up for community and to hold the space for each other so that we can become a community where people are able to thrive, where we can support each other and create the connectivity within the community that enables for flourishing. And so the work that you're doing and investing back into the community, um, in who you're hiring and who you're supporting in the mission of the work that you're doing is just so powerful. So thank you for the work that you're doing um, and for sharing it with us and, and also for the the candor about, you know, how challenging it is to like to hold something that you want, but then also to live within reality that you have to present it in certain ways for it to have credence or understanding in a culture. And so to understand, I mean, it's enough to do that in your business, but to do that in a passion project too is just an incredible body of work. So thank you for, for sharing that uh, perspective with us. And I'd love to open it up um, to the Q&A. If folks have questions, we just heard some beautiful insights um, today from Kayla, Sifa, Farine. I'm just so grateful for you um, sharing your time and talent and story with us today and love to continue the conversation um, with some questions from, from folks in the audience. So um, if you want, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask it, um, or you can write it in the chat and I'll, I'll read it aloud. and I guess I'll warm us up. Um, so as you started, as you launched your crowdsourcing or community funding, community sourcing campaign, I love that reframe. Um, how did you first communicate it? When, when um, did you first put it out into the world and um, how has your communication plan changed since that first moment? Feel um, free to answer in whatever order you like. Sure. So I first I did it on the I Fund Women, and then I realized that Instagram is just free marketing, like 100%. That's just how you're going to get out there. And so then I put it on Instagram, and then I just, you know, I actually was really, really nervous about it because I was like, these people probably think I'm crazy asking for asking for help. Um, but then I just got a lot of traction where, where people that I have made connections with for the past however many years in Burlington and in, in Boston, reposted my story. They just kept reposting and reposting. And all I asked was, if you cannot donate right now or ever, just repost. And I, I ended up getting a lot of people donating and reposting because it was something that they were really excited about as well. So I did that. I just like well, put it on blast on Instagram and just hope that my, my friends would continue to, to repost. That's such a good reminder to ask for the action that you're really looking to achieve in a post. Sometimes, you know, we make the mistake, we go through all of the work of putting together a beautiful image and writing all of this content and, oh, click this link, but we forget to ask people to do something with it. And, and there's, I don't remember the statistic off the top of my head, but um, the rates of, of response of when you ask someone to do something, it's really high response rate. Yeah, people are pretty clear and they'll do it. You, you, you put it out there the way that you want them to behave. And most people will uh, click or share or like. And so it's a really powerful reminder when you're using those platforms to don't forget to put the call to action in a really clear way that's at the top of the fold so people can see it, you know, it, it attracts their attention and, and asks them to do something in your support. Um, so that I think is a really <laughs> wise, wise insight, Sipa, thank you. Want to add on to that is, um, or, or more of an emphasis, an exclamation point is put it at the top. Sifa is actually really good at this. 
Uh, I am working on it because I need to like shorten my content, make it really punchy and just get the message out right away. And the first thing you say, my mother is actually the best editor for this because she's not super tech savvy. She only just got an Instagram to <laughs> follow me on Instagram. And she's just like, I don't want to read all of that. I don't even know how to get my giant finger to hit the read more button. I don't want to do that. <laughs> I'm like, okay, cool. Great. Uh, lesson learned. Um, what was your original question? I had a thought on that too. <laughs> uh, we were, uh, <laughs> we're talking about how you shared your story and how your story has changed. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Right. So my, my thought on that was that, um, you should, you should pat yourself on the back, even for being here and just idealizing or, or I idea creation of doing a community sourcing campaign. Um, it probably came to life first, actually, when I was writing the business plan, because I always intended on doing something along these lines. Uh, again, I, I originally had intended on doing it closer to opening. Um, but yeah, same as Sifa. Instagram is definitely your friend. Facebook is definitely your friend. I highly recommend using both platforms. There really still are people who use one more than the other or action more on one than the other, particularly actioning on Facebook is just a little bit easier um, just because the links are a little more openly present. Um, it's easier to like click through into that person's Facebook account. Um, Instagram stories are awesome. They are really hard sometimes to actually click through. Um, so I, same as Sifa though, your, your, your people are, are going to be what, what spreads the word. The only other piece of advice I would say is that, um, uh, sorry, uh, like digital news media, whether it's seven days or for me, I also have the Essex reporter, um, bloggers, influencers, people along those lines. Like I know it was great to see Sifa's campaign reposted by Hotel Vermont, Adventure Dinners, like people who have these really, really massive followings. If you have anyone in your circle who's even mildly a social influencer. It really, it, it is something you will actually want to ask them to do. Um, for me, like my, my, one of my bigger ones was um, obviously Honey Road. Um, and then uh, La Gergista, who's a winemaker in the area here, she'd asked me if she wanted, or if she wanted me to send her something. And I was like, no, just share. That's it. Um, and, you know, it, I would definitely advise if you, and you know, that's, that's a terrible way of phrasing it. All of our businesses are newsworthy whether or not seven days in Burlington free press and all these other guys will pick it up is a different story. We are all newsworthy. Um, but, um, if there is a way for them to pick up your story, I would highly encourage that you ask them to do it. They have very specific guidelines on what they can and cannot say or promote for dollars being given. Um, but, like there was a link in my seven days article that was linked to the community sourcing campaign. And I actually asked for the results of that. And there were actually 10 people that clicked on it. And like Sifa said, 10 people is 10 people. It's 10 more than you had before. That's fantastic. Absolutely. Um, I can't agree more with the power of social media to connect with people. I'd also just remind you if you don't already have two-step authentication on your accounts, um, it's really important that you keep your account secure so that your business isn't stolen out from underneath you. Um, so make sure that you are using all of the tools and technology to support your account being maintained in your business name. So that's something super important. Yeah, Katie has a question. Well, Karen, I, what you just said, can you explain that? A yeah, little bit? yeah. Just, also, thank you everybody for speaking. That was amazing. Sure. So um, in your settings, in your social media account, you can, you can set it up so that if someone uh, logs on from another device that they have to access um, a, a code or, and to swipe, swipe a certain password or um, some sort of two, two step process so that somebody can't uh, steal your password and change your, your uh, account login. And there goes your business. <laughs> um, so there are a lot of um, tech um, pirates who, uh, I guess, ransom accounts in that way. You can have your account back for X thousand dollars. So it's just an important thing to remember that it's a tool 
and you want to protect yourself uh, because it does put you out in the world. Um, and so you want to make sure that you have that available to you um, as a resource for you. Um, another really powerful thing to remember is that email lists um, are something that you you own as a business owner. So when you have the opportunity to create um, ways for people to opt in to receive information from you, whether they're um, contributing to your campaign or signing up for an event or um, signing up for a newsletter or digest, that's a great way to bring people into your inner sanctum, into your community. And then you have a, a direct line of communication with people uh, who would be maybe warm leads of people who are interested in, in supporting or funding um, projects that you're working on. So um, definitely keep that in mind too, as you're, you're growing your business. Um, I would love to hear more about uh, some of the unexpected learnings that you had along the way or that you are currently going through now that you you couldn't have anticipated when you started out but um now you're like oh if i had known that at the start i might have framed this differently i think kind of going back to the first question you asked about how did you start to tell the story and how it changed I guess that, so for me, I started, I'm like, I'm just gonna tease people a little bit in Instagram. I'm just gonna be like dropping some things in my story. I'm not ready to go like big with this yet. And there are just some people who are right away ready, like, well, where can I donate? Like, what? Are and so <laughs> it's kind of like the minute you are gonna start telling the story, there are some folks who might be ready for call to action. And so, what do you already have in place so that they can have that outlet? Um, because I didn't have things set up yet. I was just simply letting you know, like, I just got out of an exciting meeting with so and so, and they're on board, and they're like, well, how can I be on board? Um, and so, just even that, and. Um, as I'm getting ready to go live, I, and I saw that Isora Lithgow from um, Lithgow Creations just got on this call. And she always has told me as an entrepreneur herself, sometimes you gotta spend money to either get the money or to have the longer impact, right? And so your photography, like who's your photographer that you might be working with? What's your marketing looking like? And so as I get ready to go live, as much as I've loved the own work that I've done on my website, I'm now working with a friend who's in marketing, who's going through the website for me. How clean and efficient does it look? Is it too wordy? Is it, you know, is it, what are your clear call to actions for people? It, it's really helpful for me to sit with somebody who has that kind of uh, one lane uh, way of seeing things to help get me out of the clouds and like grounded on the ground with things, you know? And so, and this person is helping me to create what those official post templates will be for the Instagram. So when you have that call of action, making people repost, giving them something that they'll be excited to repost because it looks well, it looks vibrant, whatever it may be. Um, and um, so I deeply appreciate that. And I, and you know, and having photos from talented folks to be able to use as part of telling my story, um, which is why I've loved having you sort of um, uh, take my pictures and craft what All Hearts is in a variety of different ways. Um, and so I feel all of that is really, really important, especially with what I was naming earlier about, I'm trying to tell a narrative about Juneteenth and about that holiday that actually people don't really know that story. And so I have to call in a, a, a quite the squad to help me. Um, because I know what it means for me because I've lived this experience, but having other folks and other identities being like, okay, Farine, this is what I'm hearing when you tell me this. Am I missing it? Um, inviting people to be my mirror, right? Like to the marketing and to the arc of the storytelling and so forth. Um, and I just didn't uh, know that right how how important that would be because I'm like I'm a storyteller I know how to do this and so and then I was like oh my gosh Cody I need you to help me right now like <laughs> here's access to my website here's all the stuff like what do I do with all of this um, because even being an entrepreneur especially if you're solo you you hold so many hats and so when it's if it's something like this that's really important because you're trying to start up the business or you're trying to get this passion project going there's no shame and asking for that help and also spending some of the money so that it gets out exactly the way you want people to receive it. You make a first impression once, right? And so when I launch on May 1st about the whole thing, like I just, I want people to feel it. 
the way that I would want them to feel as if I was telling them the story in person to them. And so it's been great to work with some marketing people um, to help me do that. Mm, uh, that's so powerful. And first, I want to say you, it's been such um, a beautiful professional love story to see you and Isora support each other's work. And I love seeing your interactions and collaborations on Instagram, but also, you know, when we have, when you've been a, a presenter on here, you've been very clear about saying, please make sure that you give credit whenever my photo is posted, you know, double, you need to tag both of our accounts. And I just recognize that that is um, so valuable and important um, in the way that we support small business and and the people behind them, you know, because we're all here doing this work. So let's let's work for each other. Um, and something else that you said that I think is so insightful is that when we're so close to something, we think it's obvious, you know, like we're so focused on, oh, you just X, Y, Z. But then when somebody visits for the first time, you realize, oh, wait, I made that way harder than it needed to be or more confusing or, uh, you know, so helping um, ourselves to see uh, the work that we're doing from a new lens. We don't know what we don't know until we do it in community. And so getting that that perspective, uh, the out, outsider perspective on what it is that we're offering can be so, so valuable. So I think that's a really important insight and, and also just the return on investment that you get when you bring people in is that you not only have a stronger communication plan, but you also have people who are invested in the success of your project who can help you leverage and elevate your work. So you're not the only person who's deeply invested in the success. Now your website advisor is and your photographer, videographer, all of those people are on your, you're creating your team of people to support your work. Um, so I think that that's a really valuable insight. Thank you. We have a question in the chat. Um, and it is curious to hear if anyone has used Patreon as an ongoing crowdfunding option. So I can, I can start with that one because I actually did think about Patreon as an option. Um, and I, I kind of cringed away from it because even though I'm chatty, the idea of be doing something like a podcast or a video tutorial on rosé or shopping, like this is all going to be probably my, that's going to be my greatest challenge in the moment in these conversations. I'm totally comfortable. The minute that somebody presses record and I feel like I have one take, I'm a mess. So I didn't end up going with Patreon, but I did look into it and Patreon um, it's really an incredible platform. It really, really is. It's an awesome place for you to um, add whatever it is that you want to add to Patreon. And we all have worth and we all have value to the ideas that we would like to share. The only thing I would say with Patreon is just that it, it, it takes a lot of work to create what you're what you're looking to receive. It unfortunately um, doesn't really function necessarily for like, it's not just somewhere you can set up an account and then people will just throw money at that account. They want to see quite a bit of content. Um, I have a, a dear friend, Sarah Diedrich, who's a yoga instructor, and she's actually struggled quite a bit to make Patreon something that's really a quality source of income for her. I mean, she basically has to create, you know, whether it's a 15 or a 25 or a 35 minute yoga session, like almost once a week to keep adding new content and adding those notifications to people in, you know, without just wearing them out with the same message on social media, go to my Patreon, go to my Patreon, go to my Patreon. It has to have something different. It has to be go to my Patreon for my new 15 minute hip opener. You know, like it has to be specific. Um, but I do think that it's a fabulous platform. Um, I would also say the same is true for if you're a musician or you have uh, audio work that you'd like to add or even audio visual work you'd like to add. Um, I actually think this could be great for storytelling, frankly. Bandcamp is another one that actually gives you a little bit more dollars um, from that transaction than Patreon does. Um, I did want to, I'm sorry, I'm going to jump back just one quick thing just to jump on um, what Farine was saying about people people are probably the thing you should spend the most amount of money on. And, and I say that not just for marketing, not just for the confidants that you have, but I also say that for, you know, if you're at all worried about, you know, accounting or legal, one of the biggest pieces of advice that I got, and I think it's 110% true, invest in the people 
who are looking out for you. And sometimes that really is just a financial transaction that makes them obligated to look out for you. But to answer the question of what would I have done, like there was nothing necessarily about the campaign that I would have done differently, but just throughout the entire process of starting up a business. The one thing I definitely wouldn't have done differently is invest in the many thousands of dollars at this point that I've spent in legal and accounting and um, like CFO type folks who help me get everything set up. Um, you know, the, the engineer or the construction person that really made it possible for things to go smoothly during this process. Um, I can't stress that enough. You're, you know, my plates, total transparency here, my plates at the restaurant, they're coming from Amazon. They're coming from Wayfair. I can't afford nice plates, but they're going to break anyway. The people, people are who you should spend the money on and 110% tag them, mention them, give them other business because they are going to look out for you. Um, and funny enough, Sifa and I have the same photographer. <laughs> um, Patricia Trafton is a fabulous also womanpreneur who owns Soapbox Arts. Um, if you haven't been there, go check it out. Um, but yeah, invest in your people. Invest in the people who you want to bring into that inner circle. Um, and, and they will end up actually, even if you're not paying them like long, long term, they'll end up functioning as an advisor or just somebody you can turn to. Um, and you need more than you need less of those people. Also, That's like one thing too is don't be afraid of literally just asking people for help whether it's like me just constantly being kayla like every few days i text her i'm like how did you do this this doesn't make sense like don't be afraid of constantly reaching out to other women that are doing what you're doing you know because for the most part they they want to see you succeed and they want to help you like i reached out to the women of cork in in waterbury and i was like what did you do how did how much inventory did you start with because how am i supposed to know this you know, unless you ask and, and they're on your side. They, they want to see you succeed, especially in like our Kayla and in our industry, like where it's very male dominated, you know, the women have your back. That's really powerful. I got the most ridiculous question one time from someone being like, Oh, is C for your competition? I'm like, do you know me? <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> like, do you have any idea how hard it is to do what Sifa is doing? Like, that's just not how this works. If somebody else got into the storytelling game, that only lifts Farine up. That only, like, right. if now it gives the moth a reason to not just do one recording a year, but like 10 or, you know, like we all lift each other up. If, if we get into the mindset of my competitor does this or my competitor does that, actually, this is a really good reference for something. Um, and this is also really a good tie into Farine's um, point of telling a story and telling it well. Um, Simon Sinek is somebody who I really, really appreciate the work of. Um, he focuses a lot on your why, and that's something you should exercise a lot. Um, but also something he talks about um, at length is the idea of a worthy rival as opposed to a competitor. A worthy rival is someone who you look at and you say, your strength is my weakness. And that's why I feel this, this feeling of competition, but it's not competition. It's that I'm learning from you and you're learning from me. And together, if we learn from each other, we'll both do better. Um, you know, you don't, if you think about it almost in like a sports analogy, th th there's, you know, they're all competitors, but they're really just all worthy rivals in the same game. They're all taking notes from one another. They're watching film game and tape and they're all just learning from one another. And we should all do the same instead of just caring down it's not helpful it doesn't make you look good it doesn't help anybody um i forget where this started but that's my rant it's a perfect rant it's not a rant at all it's everything that we're about in the pivot and thrive community is leveraging the strengths and experience that we have as business owners and pooling them together so that we can learn and succeed faster that's that's why we come together is to create those connections so that if there's a service that you need, there's someone you can ask. And as a small business owner, you might not have the budget starting out to hire everyone, but you might be able to share or trade resources or ask. And there's a really powerful resource and tool in community. So if you haven't already done so, um, these 
fantastic people are all members of Pivot and Thrive, our community. And I hope you'll check it out if you haven't already joined. Um, try it for two weeks and see if it fits for you. But we use collaboration to learn, to elevate business practices, to network, and to create market opportunities. Next week, um, on Tuesday at noon, we have a workshop with Deshay Peacock um, talking about how to build an umbrella brand. That's for, for entrepreneurs who are multi-passionate, who have a lot of talents that they want to share and how to share that story and market what it is that you have to offer the world in a way that connects with your audience. So I'm really excited about that. And then coming up at the end of the month, um, April 26th through May 7th, we have the Wellness Fair, which is taking place um, over two weeks. It's virtual and it's bringing together more than 20 practitioners and vendors of wellness products and experiences to support you on your wellness journey. And it's just another example of how we're using collaboration to support small business success and to help our community to experience wellness in what's been a really challenging year. So I hope that if you haven't done so that you'll check it out. Um, the URL is Vermont Collaborative Circle slash Wellness Fair. Um, and I, I'm just so grateful to share this time and community space with you all. And I'm so thankful to you for sharing your stories and um, what I think has been a really inspiring and insightful conversation about how to get started and how to um, create something that brings wealth and connection to the community through the small business network. And um, I hope um, that if you are here in the audience that you'll connect with Kayla, Sifa, Farine to learn more, to support their journey, and maybe to start your own and to have an insider's in experience uh, to, to draw from as you think about how you can use community sourcing, I love that phrase, community sourcing to make your dreams a reality and to grow what it is that you have to offer into something that has a greater impact in the community. Because as you said, we're not competitors. We get to work together to create a community, a network of people that support each other. And we get to do our businesses differently and choose how we show up as entrepreneurs. So thank you so much um, for the opportunity to connect today. And um, it's just a pleasure and an honor to share the space with you. Thank you. And please uh, follow them on Instagram, All Heart Inspirations, Salt and Bubbles Wine, and Wilder Wines VT. Just really looking forward to um, seeing your collaborations. If you haven't already, take a picture while you're here and share it on social media so we can all tag each <laughs> other. And yeah, 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 yeah. I'll turn it to gallery view so you can all um, see the happy faces. Um, of people who are here and we can, you know, continue this conversation as we move on to the Instagram world um, and, and continue to have an impact uh, in the ways that we show up for each other. Um, so thank you so much for your time today. It's absolutely a pleasure and an honor. And, um, and Farine, please let, let us know how we can help. I, I don't have a liquor license yet, but <laughs> let us know how we can help. <laughs> Sounds good. I'm going to be looking May 1st. Can't wait to see it. <laughs> Do you need wine? What's going on? Why haven't we spoken? I'm, because you just started. And this is what I do, right? I make a narrative. I'm like, oh, you know, but yeah, I... I know this is inspiring. I'm like, what the, like, there's so much magic on the screen right now. Haven't I, how have I not moved these people in? Yeah, <laughs> you'll find a way. So we'll talk. I did drop the shared, I did drop the Google link so people could see the, the presentation. So you can just kind of see what the project is and all of that stuff. Um, but yeah, um, we'll, we can, we can talk. And I'm, I'm just really excited for all of this. This is awesome. Fantastic. <laughs> thank you, Karen. Like, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. This, it's a, a privilege and honor and really the most fulfilling work has ever been. So thank you. <laughs> Take thank care, you. everyone.